again, for those of you that are just joining us, we're so glad you can be a part. We're going to get straight into it today and what I believe the Lord has given to me for those of you that are watching. And even if you've never experienced Pentecost in your life, or for those of you that are walking with Jesus Christ every day, uh, I believe that something today will challenge you. Uh, Matthew chapter 27, and we're going to go to probably a place that you would not expect for me to go today, but we're going to use this as sort of our launching point today. Matthew chapter 27, verse number 45. We talked about this seven weeks ago on Easter Sunday. This was a significant moment. We're going to talk about it again today. Matthew chapter 27, verse number 45 says, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lamak shabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when he heard this said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran, took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed and offered him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earthquake, the rock split, the graves were opened. Many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. I want to challenge you today with some things that I'm going to flip the script on you and I'm going to ask you some questions today that maybe you need to ponder for yourself. And maybe by pondering these questions today is going to further your digging into your own relationship with God or maybe your own viewpoint of God. We understand that this scripture we just read marks the most significant moment in history. Uh, and I think you could actually argue, not just from a religious standpoint or a Christianity standpoint, but actually, uh, historically, this is one of the most significant events in human history. And the cross changed everything. We see from the cross, everything began to change. Uh, not only did this mark the transition of the life of Christ as he was... Uh, as he gave up the ghost on the cross, was, was buried and eventually resurrected. But the cross changed everything for you and I today. It changed the whole face of humanity. Romans chapter 5 verse 10 says, For if while we were God's enemies, we were well reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been recon reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Let me ask you this. Today, sitting where you are watching this, whether this is your first time ever watching anything that has a religious tone to it, or maybe you have been walking with Jesus for many years, how has the cross changed your life? Has it really just been about maybe making your life more comfortable or having God there so that when you have needs or troubles, you can sort of ring your spiritual butler bell and God comes to you and says, what do you need? Oh God, I need this, this, and today oh, I'll be right, I'll, I'll be right there. And I'll, God fixes your needs and says, okay, have a good day. Or what has the cross meant to you? When you look at your encounter with the cross of Calvary, wherever that crossroad happened in your life, where you came to the realization of your current state, knowing and needing a change in your life. And you can go back to that moment, whether it's happened, and I was somebody that grew up in church, so I, I don't have the, the, the definitive line in my life to say, well, I, I didn't know God, and here, here I, I, I found God. But I had my own cross moment, even though I grew up in and around church. I still had my own cross moment. So I can go back to points in my life where I found myself standing face to face with the cross of Calvary. So if I ask you today, to tell me what the cross means to you, would you give me some kind of rhetorical uh, religious answer? Well, the cross of Calvary represents the death of Jesus Christ, by which we all now have access to the love of Jesus Christ and forgiveness through sins. That doesn't mean 
what it means to you and me. That's, 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 that may sound good. It may be a great bumper sticker. Put it on a t-shirt. Paint it on your wall. But what does it mean to you in your, in your current life, in the, in the muck and the mire of life, in, the, in, the, in, in, in fighting the current battles of your day-to-day, what does the cross mean to you? You see, if the cross is simply something you experience because it was written in this book, and maybe the cross is something that you experienced because you had a moment of, uh, of, of redemption where you stood there and realized, okay, my life is not going in the right direction. Lord, I repent before you forgive me. And you were baptized and filled with the Spirit. Okay, well, that's the cross. But what does it mean to you today? Does it still have the same power today? Does it still have the same meaning today? Because you see, a lot of people today think that the work of Christ was finished on the cross. But in reality, if you read this book, you can actually say that the cross didn't finish the work. The cross actually began the work. You see, I know it said it is finished. The last words of Jesus Christ on the cross, he says it is finished. And we just read it. He gives up the ghost, right? He passes away. He dies. He's, he's dead. They pull him off the cross. They put him in the grave. See, the work of redemption is finished. One phase ended so that another could begin. We're going to talk about that next beginning here in a minute. But before we get there, you have to realize that what's been written in this book and what we're talking about isn't simply for a moment of time in our life where we come to the realization, yeah, you know what, my life's not really going the way it needs to be going, or maybe I've really messed up, or maybe I'm bound by certain things, or maybe my life is, 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 it a, is it a place where I, I, I never desired it and I need to change. Okay, I acknowledge God, I need to change. God, I'm a sinner. God, I, I need you to change me. And that's awesome, it's great, right? So that, that, that's the moment. But can anyone sit here today and tell me that that's it? Well, it's done. It's over with. I got that done. Now let's get on with something else. Or if you could look back at the last 5, 10, 15, some of you that are watching 20, 25, 30 years of your life where you've been walking with Jesus, can you ever say that it stopped at that moment where you stood before the cross the first time and experienced the, the, the power, the love of Christ? So for those of you that ever had that experience at the cross today, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not offering you a moment of time. I'm not saying God wants to give you a moment today. Well, here's the cross, and God can change you today, and it's a moment. I'm saying that this is about a new beginning. The Bible says that when we are baptized in Christ, old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. It's a new thing. So before we get too far into this, Maybe you could take a moment and realize that, you know what, the cross of Calvary means this to me. Here's how the cross has continued to work in my life. Because, let's be frank, nobody, because of this stuff we got right here, the stuff that when you pinch it, it hurts, called flesh, and we have our will, and we are inundated around us with so much stuff nowadays that's trying to pull us away from the things of God. If you only went to the cross one time, you might want to stop and revisit it again today. In fact, I will be as bold as to say this. If there is not a time every day where you take a moment and let the blood of Jesus Christ wash over you afresh and anew every day. I'm thankful for Sunday. I'm glad today that's Sunday. And those of you that are watching and and maybe today you've set aside because you're busy and today you're watching this and this is a day where you're going to engage. I'm thankful for that. But if that's all you ever experience, I got a challenge for you on a side note. This is not where we're going today, but it's a fun little challenge. Some of you actually might take me up on this challenge. I hope I'm not around if you do. How many of you would get up this morning and bathe and then say, you know what, man, I don't need anything the rest of the week. No deodorant, no bathing, I'm good. You know what? You probably wouldn't smell that bad for the rest of the day. Tomorrow, uh, depending. But by Tuesday, mm. and Wednesday, your coworkers may be social distancing for other reasons besides CDC guidelines. And I guarantee you by Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, there'd be some serious 
odors coming. Because we understand, you know what, for proper hygiene, you probably should try to bathe every day. I'm not going to put that at that there's no CDC guidelines on bathing. But I'm going to suggest that if you at least would go at least maybe, maybe two days. Just throwing that out there. Why? Because we understand that if we don't take care of ourselves naturally, our bodies are built to break down. You don't brush your teeth every day, there's things that are going to happen. You don't eat food every day, your body's going to break. There's certain things we know from a natural standpoint that if we don't engage in, if that is the case naturally, what would be your spiritual condition today? Let me ask you this. When's the last time you took a spiritual bath? I know it sounds funny to use that terminology. Well, I, last Sunday, I, I asked the Lord that he would just wash over me. It's wonderful. I felt God's presence touch my heart. It was just awesome experience with God. That was seven days ago. You mean to tell me in the last seven days you, you haven't had anything in your life that has come against you, you've had no engagement, and you have absolutely lived in a perfect bubble of utopic existence where nothing in your flesh has ever deviated off the course? No, that's not the case at all. So, before we even go further into this, I just want to challenge somebody that maybe you need to realize the cross is still as true today as it was the first time you, met, you, you encountered it. The cross still has as much power today. And not just from a salvation aspect or just because it's a great story that we tell every Easter and we celebrate it or I wear it around my neck or I have a picture of it or I put it on my wall or I've got a bumper sticker or I hang it from my rearview mirror or when I, people go to work, they know I've got a cross on my desk. They know I'm a believer. That's great. But how does it pertain, pertain to you every single day when you walk with Jesus Christ? Why is this important? Because we can't get to the next part if we don't understand the power of the cross. You see, the world we live in is a, is a world of conflict. In fact, the Bible talks about the world as a place of conflict all the way back since the fall of man. It started in Genesis chapter 3 with the fall of man. It created this conflict. We're in a place of constant conflict. We're in a place of tremendous uh, divisiveness that our world is living in. And so we are living in a place of conflict. But that's talking naturally. We have natural conflicts right now. Uh, there are global conflicts. But as a greater part of that, there's a spiritual conflict. Now, I know if I say this to some of you, you may get a little spooked or you may get a little, uh, you may not even believe it. But it's true whether or not you believe it or not today. But right now, there is, an, there is an unseen world that's happening right now that's just as real as the seen world. Now, there's a barrier between that world and this world where we can't see. But we're living in a natural world, right? I can touch something. I can feel it. I can flip through pages of this book because it has tangible mass to it. The molecules that make up the material are placed together to create this leather binding and to create these, these pages, and I can touch and feel it. So because of that, I therefore say this is a real book because I can feel it, touch it. But there's another world that's just as real today. And in fact, it's a world of greater conflict that is taking place. But see, most of us don't play credence to this life every day because for us, this is not something we, we exist in, right? We're more concerned about the tangible things, things we can place our hands on. This book has a value to it. This book costs, I don't know how much paid for this, this Bible. It was a nice Bible, so we probably paid, we probably paid a good, good little amount for this, for this Bible. It has value to it. Because it has value to it, I know in order for me to have enough money to purchase this, I have to give an amount of my time every week to whatever profession I've chosen. And when I get to the end of that week or I get to the end of the 1st or the 15th or I get to the end of the month, whatever your pay, pay cycle is, I'm going to get money back once the government takes most of it and whatever else I do to pay my bills, whatever's left over, I can buy tangible things. We get that. We understand that. We build our entire existence around that. 
But there's another world that's happening, a greater world of conflict that for most of us, we pay no credence to. We even, I'm not talking about for those of you that are watching that may have no idea what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about people that claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, that when you wake up every day, you pay no credence to this other world. It's this almost like out of sight, out of mind. Well, you know what? If I don't think about it, it's not really true. Well, it's happening every day. You see, the problem is when the veil of the temple was torn, we just read that Matthew chapter 27 says the veil of the temple was torn in two. There's a lot of metaphorical and there's a lot of uh, 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 biblical um, meaning to that whole torn reference. But there's something that the cross marks today that is of great significance to you and I. Because you see, the cross became the portal or the cross became that place by which we can now enter into that other world. Cross became the place where the two worlds met. You see, the cross became a place of tangible reference. Now, you and I can't go back and we can't stand at the foot of Calvary. You can go to Jerusalem today and there's several places. I've never personally been, but I know people have been. And there's several places that you can go to, to in Jerusalem today that they speculate may be the place where Jesus was crucified. Now, whether it is or not, who knows? But we could, if we had the ability to, we could go back to the very spot and say, this is the place that the cross of Calvary was placed. This is the place where Jesus was crucified. There's tangible evidence there. For those that were standing that day at the foot of the cross, we could read the story if we had time. We could read the story. And they said, "Is this, maybe he's talking to Elijah. Well, let's see if Elijah's going to come. They were standing there experiencing this. And at the end, when we read that after all of these kind of cataclysmic events took place, the darkening of the sun, the earthquake, the shaking, all of this happening, the soldier standing around said, you know what? This dude must be the son of God. That was their sort of that was sort of their their uh, their conclusion based off the evidence that was surrounding him. Because why? There was tangible evidence they could see. But if you know anything about the cross of Calvary, and work with me for a moment, I know some of you I can feel I'm losing some of you, but we're going somewhere today. What was the significance of that? The cross of Calvary represented a tangible evidence of an intangible world. In fact, the Bible says this. If the God of this world would have known what was going to happen, he would have never crucified Jesus Christ on the cross. There was a conflict that was happening, a supernatural conflict that was happening. And guess who was in the middle of that conflict? It was you and I. We were in the middle of that. We were the prize that was being fought for. You and I. And the cross became the tangible representation of the ability and the desire of our Heavenly Father to go as far as he, any person could go or as any deity to go that he would robe himself in flesh, come to this earth and die for you and I. He was willing to go all in to win that prize. That was you and me. Now, I know for some of you today, it's hard for you to believe that because you've never felt love you were rejected from your child. You've been abused. You've been misused. It seems like everybody in the world has only taken from you and nobody has ever given you anything. And it's hard for you to believe in something you've never seen, touched, or felt could ever love you to that degree. That's where faith comes in. John chapter 3 says that if we believe, if we believe in this event, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him. You know, I can't, I can't give you a, I think there's somewhere, and, I, and again, I don't say this disrespectfully to anyone's faith, but I believe there's somewhere, some, some, some shrine, some place in, in, in uh, some cathedral somewhere in Israel where they actually feel like they have a splinter from the cross of Calvary. I don't know if it's a splinter from the cross of Calvary or something they bought at Home Depot. And I don't mean that to be disrespectful, but I don't need a splinter from the cross of Calvary to prove to me that it's real. 
You see, I'm, I'm, I'm a, let me give, me give me one second here. We live in a world that tells that, that you say, hey, believe this, and our reaction is prove it, right? Because why? We've been burned so many times. We, we saw a picture, my wife and I, she was on Facebook the other day, and there was this picture of this uh, event that was taking place where you know, supposedly a group of people were on this bridge, and this guy was there contemplating into his life, and they had reached out, and they're holding on to him, and they got ropes tied around him, and they're grabbing him, and there's this whole long spiel about the power of love and how these people are reaching out, and it was a beautiful picture, but I have to be frank with you. My first reaction was, is that really, really true? Is that real? Oh, you're very skeptical. Unfortunately, we live in the world of Photoshop. We live in the world of video editing. Tell my kids all the time when they go on this stuff, they see, oh my goodness, amazing. I'm like, wait a minute, that's not real, it's edited. Elvis is not alive, I promise. But dad, he's walking down the street. No, it's not, it's photos, it's edited. That's what we live in. We live in a world of mirages. We live in a world of fake. We live in a world where, where you can't trust anything you see anymore with your eyes. We know there wasn't five guys or six guys called the Avengers that fought off aliens to save the world. We know it's a movie. They spent millions upon millions of dollars creating a fantasy world with all of these computer-generated graphics, and they had five actors standing in front of a green screen and, and weren't even really there. But it's created this massive industry that's based off a world that we can create. Now you go online and you see somebody's picture. And I was in CVS the other day, and there was some advertisement. I don't know what it was for, but it was an advertisement, and it really stuck out to me. It was a picture of a man and a woman, and they, I don't even know what they were advertising. And it, made, it had little tiny letters at the bottom, giant picture, tiny letters at the bottom. Results may not be the same or something like that. Photo digitally enhanced. Because we, we live in that kind of world. So... When, when we see things, there's a built-in for a lot of us. I'm sure there's some still out there that believe. But there's a lot of skepticism that's built into our world today. Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. I mean, it has absolutely uh, created a, a world that we don't really know or understand because we can only see through the lens of a camera or through the lens of somebody's editing capabilities. See, the problem with that is, is that we bring that same kind of skepticism when we talk about things here, because we talk about the cross of Calvary and it's, we'll prove it. I got to be frank with you today. If I sat here today with a splinter that had been authenticated and carbon dated and by the greatest experts in this world, and they said, it is definitively, this is definitively a piece of wood that dates back to the time of Christ. And then we took it to some fancy lab and they, 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 they went down into the depths of the, the grains of that wood and they found way down depth a drop of blood. And they were somehow able to extract that blood out of there. And they did a DNA test and they said, God is the Father. It's DNA proven. And I had that sitting here right now. With that evidence before you, it would not make your decision one bit easier. How do you know that's real? How do you know I didn't go to Home Depot, rip a piece of wood off? Lumber's expensive now. That'd be an expensive splinter. I grab that piece of wood. I get a couple of guys I pay online to be experts, put it on here. That's the world we live in, right? So today, I can't offer you tangible proof in a world that I can hand you a splinter or hand you the rusty nail or hand you a piece of the crown of thorn and say, here. But you know what? I can offer you something greater. I can offer you the ability to stand before the cross of Calvary right where you are and feel the power of Jesus Christ in your room, in your bedroom, in your car, if you're standing right now in a park walking down. The same God that was on that cross is the same God that's right where you are. That's the greatest proof you need. But what's the difference between where you are and being able to cross over to the other side? Well, first, it requires a faith because we live in this conflict. We live in this world of conflict. And the Bible talks about this conflict keeps our eyes blinded. 
Scripture says if our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost, who the God of this world has blinded their eyes that they cannot see. But the cross is the greatest eye-opening experience in our life. So we live in this conflict. We live in this world of conflict. We're, we're, we're dealing with all this. But you see, the beauty about the cross is the cross only tells a part of the story. I'm thankful for the cross of Calvary. But that only tells a part of the story. See, the cross of Calvary gives me access to another world. But when I get into that other world, I still need tools to be able to function in that other world. I can, I can have access to something, but to be able to function in that, to be able to recognize the conflict and to do something about it. See, that's another thing. You see, today you might be dealing with things in your life that you have no ability in your humanity or inability in your life and the resources available to you to deal with. You might be dealing with things in your life that are out of the scope of your ability to change. Maybe it's the environment you're living in. Maybe it's the people that you've surrounded yourself with. Maybe it's the events by which you grew up in. And all these things are shaping who you are and they're affecting you every day. And they affect your decisions. They affect your emotional state. They affect how you function in life. And so you have no ability to change that. And so you've kind of learned how to navigate those things or uh, medicate those things. Or you've learned how, you know, these are my buttons not to get pushed, so you make sure that you don't go anywhere near those buttons, and then you make sure no one around you goes near those buttons, and you have caution tape and red flags and all these things because you recognize these are things I can't control. You see, there's so many people nowadays, and I say this, and I wish I was just talking about people that don't know Jesus, but I'm talking about people that claim to know him. There are so many people nowadays that are walking around as prisoners to themselves, to their past, to their situation. You see, I'm thankful for the cross of Calvary. We're getting to this minute, but I wanted to make this before we got too far into this. I'm thankful for the cross of Calvary. I'm thankful for the power that it means to me. That it has tangible aspects to me today because the cross of Calvary is not theoretical. It's not religious. In fact, i got to be frank with you, the cross of Calvary is not somewhere I go to a place and to witness. The cross of Calvary is as real to me sitting here today as it is any other place. It can be and should be as real to you today sitting wherever you are. I'm thankful for that. But you see, the cross gives me access to something even greater. Acts chapter 1, and uh, I'll just read it here and make it quicker. Acts chapter 1 tells us what that access is and the importance of that. Acts chapter 1 verse 4, being assembled together with them, he commanded them, he meaning Jesus, commanded them not to, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not, not many days not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all of Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. You see, the cross tells us the access point, but this event foretells of how we can function in this other world, this other world of conflict. This world of conflict that is affecting you and I today, whether we give credence to it or not, it's still affecting you and I today because there is a, the same conflict that took place 2,000 years ago for the prize of our soul is the same conflict that's taking place today for the prize of our soul. But we've been given access through the cross of Calvary to a power that's available to you and I today to engage in this fight. 
But you see, the problem is with it is there's four types of believers. There's four types. I, I, I could say there's more. You could say it less, but we're going to use four today as a nice round number. There's four. Which one are you? We're going to find out today which one are you. Because whatever believer you are, it's going to play out how your life is lived and the fruit by which we could read through the theological aspects of this event. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 talks about the Holy Ghost falling. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Ghost falls. Acts chapter uh, 2, verse 38, Peter gives this formula by which we can partake in the same event. All this stuff is great theological. Then we could go back into the Old Testament and tell you what it means in the fulfillment of the promise of God. All that's great. But how does that affect you and I today? What does that mean for you and I today? Today is the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost, according to Acts chapter 2, was the day in which this event happened. It happened today. This is the day that this event happened. It's not, it's not theoretical. It's not uh, circumstantial. It happened today when the day of Pentecost was fully come. This is the day of Pentecost. But not just from a religious theological viewpoint. How does that affect you and I today, and how are we applying that? I said it to the beginning to you today. What does the cross mean to you? Okay, the cross has theological implications. The cross may even have these great uh, uh, um, eternal. Well, the cross of Calvary is the place by which we all have to visit so we can get to heaven. Okay, great. I can go down to the bookstore and read that on 50,000 books. What does the cross mean to you? To you. Describe the cross of Calvary to you. If I ask you today, so-and-so, what does the cross of Calvary mean to you? And maybe I could ask it further. What does the cross of Calvary mean to you today? Not the first time you experienced it. Yes, great. Well, I was baptized in, in, in water in 1984. Well, congratulations. That's awesome. But what does it mean today? It's 2021, in case you forgot. What does it mean today? When's the last time you experienced the power of the cross? Because if it was 1984, good Lord, you might want to go back and revisit that. That's been a long time. When's the last time you experienced the power of the cross? So we've established that. But there's a second thing that's available to us. Through the power of the access to the cross of Calvary that gives us access, then Jesus said, because of these events that have happened, because the fact I was... I was uh, I was crucified, and now I'm resurrected. I'm about to give you access to something even greater. Because I'm going to my Father, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to give you a piece of me to carry inside of you through my spirit. And here's how it's going to happen. And he foretells us, and he, these events play out in Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2. But it really leads us today to 2021. What kind of believer are you? There's four types. There's four categories. There's... The first category is sort of the passive believer. This is the kind of believer that doesn't really act or speak. Now, this passive believer, you might come to church. You might watch online nowadays in the modern world we live in. If asked, you would probably confess, yeah, I believe in God. And you know what? If persuaded enough, and cranked on enough, you might even invite someone to church with you. But that's kind of where it stops. You have your life. You do your thing. You have your goals, your dreams. You have what you want in life. God fits into that, but God is an accessory. So when we read Acts chapter 1 to that group... I got to be frank with you. When we talk about we're going to receive power, power for what? Power so that my life can get better? I got to be frank with you. He never said it would be easy. I got to, I got to help somebody here today, and, and I'm not going to go much longer, but I'm just going to bust the bubble once again because it needs to be busted. If you're coming to God so that your life can be perfect, that's not what God promised. If you're coming to God so you never have another rough day, not going to happen. If you're coming to God so you never have to deal with anything in life, not going to happen. He said, lo, I will be with you always. Because there's going to be some low points in life. 
He didn't say, hey, come to me, because if you come to me, I'm going to make everything perfect. So nowadays, it's funny. I say funny, not haha, but I guess it's just sort of sad and ironic that God has become an accessory. God has become this thing that we kind of carry around. It's a lucky rabbit's foot. It's, a, it's, it's an app on a phone, right? I need to go somewhere to eat. I type in Yelp. What's the best place here? I go on Google. I Google it. I've got access to tools right here on my device that can give me access to everything around me. If we're traveling somewhere, ask my wife. I just have a thing for maps. I don't know why I'm just like that. I'll spend hours looking at maps. And by the time I get to somewhere, I've kind of pictured in my mind where all the roads go. I, I've, I've accessed all the information. I love it. But you know what? God's not an app on my phone. Oh, what do I need? I, I'm having a rough day. Let me pull up my app. Yes, God, I'm having a rough day. Could you pat me on the back and tell me it's going to be okay? I really need you. <gasps> oh, no. Today's Sunday. This is the day. I got to turn on my app. I got to get quick. That's passive Christianity. Passive believing doesn't really have, have any credence to what we just read in Acts chapter 1. In fact, the cross for passive Christianity, yeah, it was a great moment. It was a great moment. I felt the love of Christ, but that's where it ended. I may, I may carry around a cross. I may place it on my neck. I might put it as a tattoo because I'm really that devoted to that moment. But it was a moment. It's not life. The Bible says, new mercies I see every day. Every day. But if I'm a passive person, it's an accessory. It's something I need at certain times, but outside of that, it's there. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, I'm not going to impose or I'm not going to, you know, I, 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 I'm just going to do my thing. I'm going to do my life. So that's first kind of believers. Is sort of the passive believer. The second thing, I'll call it the, I wrestled with how, we, how I could describe this. This is the, the intellectual believer. What I mean by that is this is the kind of person that speaks but doesn't act. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the religious believer, if I could call it that. And I know that's a, a term that some of you may not know what I mean by that because a lot of people look at religion as a positive term, but in this context, it's, I'm not using it that way. So I don't want to throw you off because in the Bible, there was a lot of people that spoke it but didn't act it. So there's a group out there that you, you can talk it, you can speak it, you can, you can talk about the the experience of Calvary through this theoretical maze of all the scriptures. You can quote to me every scripture in the Bible that talks about the cross or the promise of the cross. You can go all that. But that's where it ends because if I got into your life and I taped your mouth shut, could I see any evidence of the reality of the power of God in your life? Could I see that? Could I find that? Would I be able to see that? And I'm not saying that from a perspective that it's somehow I'm coming from this place of almightiness looking down on you. I, I, I get asked that my own self. If I, if, if, if I took away all of, the, all, of the, all the things that I think are my identity and took it, can you still see the evidence? I can talk about it. I said this earlier, I'm 40 years old. I've been... I literally started going to a church when I was a week old. My parents were the pastor. My mom played the organ. And so within a week of birth, I was church. I, I, can, I can give you information with the best of them. But information, intellectual problem, doesn't mean that I'm living it out. Yeah, I can tell you, well, the Bible says here in Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, that you shall receive power. And trust me, I've been around long enough, I can make that even sound better than that. I could make that sound good. Give me a minute. Let me get lathered up for a second. I can get that to where Acts chapter 1 sounds fantastic. But what does that mean? You see... 
it's great on Sunday, but it doesn't have any application on Monday. There's a lot of people, and they know, they know, they know, they know, and can regurgitate so much, but they don't know anything. So the first category of believers is the passive ones. They're the ones that, they just kind of, they, they, God's there, he's a part, he's an accessory. He, he's, he's something that, that, you know, it's good to have, you know? Kind of like insurance. Nobody wants to pay money in insurance, but if you need it, it's good to have. God's like that, right? I go to Sunday, I pay my premium every week on Sunday morning. Most of the time, I don't need it, but every once in a while, I'm going to need to cash in on that. I'll pay my deductible, which is probably, what, a 15-minute prayer or 30-minute prayer. What, what is your deductible? It depends on what your premium is. What's your godly deductible? 15-minute prayer, three chapters of Bible reading? I mean, if you haven't really paid your premium after a while, you're probably going to have to throw in at least a day of fasting because your deductible is probably going up because God's your insurance. So today, oh Lord, Sunday, my deductibles do. Okay, God, I give you my day today. You're so awesome. I love you. You're awesome. You're great. You're awesome. I love you. Oh, let's sing a worship song. I love you, Jesus. You're so great. I could never ask for a better insurance policy than you. Awesome. Got my deductible paid. Now, I hope I don't mess up or someone runs into me or I don't run into them this week. I will have to cash in on my deductible. And you know what? God has a good driver discount. Who's it, Allstate? Allstate had nothing on God. Because if you've been around for 20 years and you haven't had any kind of issues, the deductible goes down. I mean, you don't really need to do that much. And God will still, that's, you say, well, that's goofy. It may be silly, but if you get into some people's life, they live that way. No, you don't come out and say that, but if you look at the evidence, that's the way it is. So that's the first type. Second type is you can talk it. Well, you can sit here today and you can give us a breakdown on all the scriptures, but there's no action to follow that. The Bible says faith without works is dead. You can say, I got faith, 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 but there's no action to it. I've said it before. I've used it. I'll use it again this morning. But it's like me walking up to you and saying, you know what, I love you. And then smacking you across the face. But I really love you. I've got tears to tell you I love you. What are you going to believe more? What I say or what I do? The third type of Christian, that's the private ones. Now this is becoming more evident in our world today. You do all the acts. You've got a down pat. You can, you do everything, but that's where it stops because you don't want to, you don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers, but neither do you want anybody to know. So you kind of live in this private world. And you know what? I'd say this, and this is going to be another one of those controversial things I say and probably get myself in trouble, but it won't be the first or the last time I say something like that. Unfortunately, a lot of churches have promoted this private Christianity because we've closed in our world. We've huddled around. This world is so bad out there. It's just terrible. Let's all get closer. Come Let's come. Let's huddle up. I heard a preacher say recently, I thought it was fantastic. So I'll, I'll quote him, even though I agree with it. He said, we've preached about the rapture so much, we've made the rapture happen before it has even come. Because we live as if the rapture's already taken place. We live so cut off from the world around us. And we feel so good because we are so holy and righteous because we cut ourselves off. Then why did we need power to be witnesses? Go read it, Acts chapter one. It wasn't so that you can receive power so you can come together and dance and shout and run the aisles and feel the power of God and get 17 goosebumps when you go to work tomorrow, you feel like I'm walking with you. Not, I'm not making fun of any of that. But that's not why Acts chapter 1 said it was going to happen. Finally, it's the last category. It's the category that this talks about. That's active believers. Those are the ones that not only 
can speak it, but they can walk it. What category are you? Are you a passive? Are you intellectual? Are you a private? Are you an active believer? You see, active believers can't be active one day a week. It doesn't work that way. Active Christians, well, oh, it's 10 o'clock. It's time to get active. Ding! Hurry up, get this show on the road. About 12 o'clock, my activity button has to turn off because I got other things to do today. And then maybe on Sunday night, I'll turn it back on for a few minutes. What is it, Thursday or Wednesday night? Whatever I choose, I'll probably turn it on for a couple hours then. That's, that's not what active Christian. Active Christianity is day by day. And if you think the world we live in right now and the conflict that's going on around us where everything is trying to strip us away from, under, from even the fabric of who God is, if we don't understand how to walk in this active lifestyle, we'll never make it. But you see, here's the problem. And the excitement about that, if I told you to do that, that's, that's kind of hard to do. Because just to be frank with you, if I could change my life, I'd have already changed it. But that's the beauty of the cross, but also the, the power of the experience of Pentecost is that it gives you and I power. The Bible says that when we receive his spirit, we are the sons of God. We walk into this other aspect. As many as are called and are led of the spirit are the sons of God. We can be this. It's available to us, but it's not available to us because it's, a, it's written on this book that I'm not negating the power of this, of this book. I'm not negating or in any way trying to diminish the word of God, but I'm saying it's not any good if it stays on this book. But if it's this power of the pages that say this is available to you and me today, and then by faith I say, Lord, I believe, and I can activate my faith by following up my faith my confession with action. And then these words are not just intangible, but they become tangible evidences through the experiences I can have with a living, true God. That's not a figment of my imagination, not a historical figure, but it's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And wherever you are right now, whether you're sitting on your couch or in your favorite chair or at your kitchen table, watching me on a screen, watching me on a phone, watching me at another time, watching me in your car, or you're not even watching, you've got it earbud in you're listening god is able to ex be as real to you right now as he would anywhere if you're willing to agree to say you know what i believe and activate that faith because you know what there's a whole aspect of life that's waiting for you and I'm not just talking about those of you that never experienced this. I'm talking about some of you that have been around for 10, 15, 20 years. But I've seen you lately. I've come in contact with you lately. I've watched your life over the last couple months. And you're not, you're not living an active lifestyle. And I'm not talking about your dress and all that. that you, that's what's put that over the side. I'm talking about the fact you are not living a life as an overcomer. You're not walking in faith. You're just surviving. Or maybe even worse, you're so caught up into the existence that the world has fed you that this is happening happiness. You're so caught up in just in what next or getting this or my next career or my next job or my next paycheck or my next promotion. And I'm not saying that, that none of that's, that that's inherently wrong, but if that's what you're looking for, and I'm not, I, what's amazing is what did the angel say? Why do you look for the living among the dead? What's amazing is you realize that life led to emptiness the first time you came to God, but now that you've come to God, you think you can find fulfillment back in that same hole. Do you not remember the Bible says, don't forget the pit from where you were dug? Somebody needs to wake up today. And what better day to wake up to realize today is the day that this promise that we read in Acts chapter 1 came to pass. And that same promise is available to you and I today to live a life of real, active, true, powerful Christianity. Because i got to be frank with you. This world does not need another church that just says, we're a church, here we are. This world doesn't need that. This world needs something real and tangible. This world needs something that shows authentic, true power of Jesus Christ. Not something you come to, but something you can experience right where you are. Can you go somewhere where God is? Yes, but why go somewhere when he's right there? 
right where you are. You don't need some kind of set up place, holy place, where you go, well, this has got to be a place because it's a holy place. No, where you're standing right now, where you're sitting right now, God's just as real. But you and I have to make a decision today. Can we engage in our faith? What, what, what kind of believer are you going to be today? Well, I'm a, uh, 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 that was great. I'm glad you said that. That was awesome. I, I really appreciated those words today. That was great. I even got a couple notes. I'm going to put that. I'm going to remember those. I'll put them on my phone in case every once in a while I can go look. That was great. Awesome. What's for lunch? Oh, it's a nice day outside today. Let's, let's go out work in the yard. Let's go out and have some. Who, what do you guys want to do today? That's passive Christianity. Hey, look, I'm coming back next Sunday. Don't worry. I'll be here. Give me some more good stuff. I like, I like, I like it. Man, every once in a while, if you want to throw something out there on during the middle of the week, I might be able to carve out a few minutes to grab it. But, you know, I got a lot of stuff going on right now. Life is busy. That's passive believing. And after a few minutes, this last 45 minutes of, is going to be a memory. Or how about this? You're going to go, oh, you know what? That was great. I believe it. Yes, I want that. That's awesome. I, 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 I believe it. I believe it. And then today, there's going to be no action to that. You're going to wake up tomorrow morning. I mean, that was, that was awesome yesterday. I, I believe that. But no act, action. Or you might say, well, that was great. That was awesome. And you're just going to go, okay, honey, what, can I, what, what else can I do to get closer to Jesus? But, Lord, you know, it's just you and I here. This whole world's falling apart. I mean, my goodness, this, if you not realize God, the world's going just absolutely nuts. So please, Lord, just protect me. Keep me. I want to be, just hold me. I'm going to hold on till you come back, God. I'm just going to hold on this crazy world we're living. It's just bad people everywhere. Or are you going to say, you know what? I believe, but not only do I believe it, I want to experience it. But you know the power of what I'm saying today? It's just as real tomorrow. Try it. On your way to work, whether that commute is in a car or that commute is from the kitchen table to the, to the uh, desk in your living room, take a moment somewhere along the way. Say, God, be as real to me today as you were yesterday. God, I want you activated in my life today just as much as yesterday. God's going to go, oh, man. Oh, I'm so sorry. What's today? Hey, Gabe, Michael, come here, guys. Is today Monday? Ooh, I can't help him. Ugh. Oh, you just missed it. I'm sorry. Listen, look, do your best this week. It's going to be tough. I know. It's, it's just a tough world. But listen, do your best. When you get to Friday... Just know Sunday's coming. I'm, look, I'm going to spend all week, me and Gabe, Mike, I got like a whole host of people here. We're going to work real hard to make Sunday amazing for you. Hold on for the next six days. Trust me, it's going to be good. It's going to be worth it. But I Listen, I know. Look, you know, Tuesday, you might have a real bad. Wednesday, you're probably going to get some bad news. Thursday, you're going to probably have an attack of fear. I can't help you then because, you know, Sunday's my day. I can only work then. But I promise, if you could just make it through that, and if you need something to help you along the way, pff, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll, you know, do what you got to do to survive. But Sunday coming, I'm going to load you up. I mean, literally, it's going to be amazing. Just wait. And am I right, Gabe? Uh, one of these days, though, Gabe's going to blow his trumpet. It's going to be even better. But until then, we're just going to, you know, Sunday's coming. Does it really think how God works? Or is when, when you wake up in the morning, is God going to be sitting there on the, on the side of your bed going, can I go with you today? Can I be with you today? When you're sitting there brushing your teeth in the morning, God's going to be sitting there going, hey, psst, hey, let me go to work with you today. Psst, could I, could I ride with you to work? Can I go with you to the doctors? Hey, psst, can I sit there when you and your Spouse are going through that moment. W would you let me help? Hey, when, when, hey, on Tuesday, when fear enters, I'll, I'll be right there. And guess what? 
I'm, I really want to help if you let me. I, I, I really want to help because I love you and I'm there for you and I want to help you. What do you think it's like for God? And I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I really am done. The Holy Ghost is still trying to talk to somebody. What do you think it's like for you to sit there with your world falling apart? Fear, worry, doubt, hurt, pain, absolutely crushing you. And your heavenly father right there going, would you let me help? And you sit there and you don't even take a moment to say, God, help me. I don't know what to say. Uh, there's no fancy words necessary. Sometimes I gotta be frank with you. The only words I can get out are Jesus. And I gotta be honest, there's a couple of times I don't even get the Jesus, I just get the ja. Ja. And you know what's amazing? Even in that first syllable that say Jesus. I wish I could tell you I've lived like this my entire life. Well, you grew up in church. Yeah. As they say, Growing up in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than walking into a barn makes you a horse. You may know it, but you don't live it. I knew it, but I didn't live it. I think in the last 15 months, I have lived in a way different than my first 38 years. I've had to engage and activate, because you know what? A lot of the things I was using were gone. I was sitting here in my basement on Sundays. I was sitting without these things and God, I had to go to a whole nother realization of my walk with God and a realization of who God is. What do you want to be and what's available to you today in this book and what are you going to do about it? Father, in the name of Jesus, by your grace today, I've spoken what you've given me to speak. I've not tried to add to or taken from those things. And Lord, I believe you have spoken. I felt you speak to those that are watching today. And Lord, there's so many of us that are sitting here watching and maybe some of the things today that were said we don't want to hear, but we know we need to hear them. I pray in the name of Jesus that the power of your conviction would move upon us today, that we could see where we are, but more importantly, not just see where we are, but see where you're trying to take us. There may be some things in us that we need to change to get there, but God, your grace is sufficient. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would open our eyes today that we could see you that the spirit of revelation would be released upon us today, that we can see and understand and know you in a greater way. But more than that, I loose the power of your spirit to fall right now in the name of Jesus upon every heart, that even as we pray right now, they're calling out to you saying, God, I hear you. I need your help. And Lord, you don't, they don't have to wait for 30 minutes or an hour or two hours. But God, at the mention of your name, you said you would be there. So Lord, even as we pray right now, and those that are praying with me are calling out to you saying, Jesus, I need you, that your spirit would fall upon them, that your power would fall upon them, that your love would surround them. In the name of Jesus, I come against every spirit of the of addiction. I come against every spirit of depression. I come against every spirit of fear. I come against every spirit of worry and doubt in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I speak the power and the demonstration of the Holy Ghost right now to fall on those that are watching and those that are beginning to engage with their faith, that God, you would show them the power of your spirit and the reality of who you are right here, right now, in this moment. Not next week, not next month, not next year, but they would have a now faith in a now moment at this time. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray, God, that you would make yourself real and known. You say you stand at the door and you knock. If any man would open up and let you in, that you would come into their heart. So Father, today as you knock, I speak by faith that those that are hearing the knock would open up the heart, the door of their heart, that they would 
experience you and know you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's freedom to be found in you. There's deliverance to be found in you. There's healing in you. And it can happen today, Lord, because your word said today can be the day. If I would believe and walk in faith and activate my faith, not just in a passive way, but I would activate my faith today by asking and believing and receiving that today you can change my life today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I speak these things today. I activate these things today. I lose a manifestation of the power of God to fall in the name of Jesus Christ today. Not just intellectually that we know these things, not just because we heard a few words and those were good, but we're on our life, but because today we have felt and seen and known the reality of who you are today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, someone right now, God's trying to minister to you. God's trying to show you who he is. I know this may be awkward. It may be different. It may not be what you're normally used to. But if you would just reach out right where you are and just say, God, here I am. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. But God, I want to experience you today. And if you would do that right now, you're going to begin to feel the power of God right where you're at today. In the name of Jesus. 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 Make yourself real and known, God. Make yourself real and known to those that are hungering for you today. Those that are seeking for you today. Remove the blindness off our eyes that we can see and know the reality of who you are today. Not just on a Sunday experience, but on a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday, a Friday. In the name of Jesus. 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 Today, you can experience these things, not just in this moment, but it can continue. Just because we're stopping today doesn't mean you have to stop. You can continue. God is not bound by time. He's not bound by space. He's not bound by this broadcast. He's not bound by technology. He's as real today and all day as he is in any moment. If you would just continue to watch and continue to reach out and engage with him throughout the day in Jesus name. God bless you. Thank you for watching. I pray come back and be with us again next week, 10 a.m. Bishop Chester Wright will be with us next Sunday morning here live at Antioch West. And I pray this week, tomorrow morning, He's just as real tomorrow as he is today, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 24, 7, 365. That's the kind of God that's available to you and I today. In Jesus' name, God bless you. We'll see you again next time.